Hi, I'm Lee, and welcome to my studio and YouTube channel, where I discuss tips, tricks, and techniques for oil and acrylic painters. In this video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about problem solving for artists. Oftentimes in art, you hear this phrase, the only rule in art is there are no rules. Well, I like the sentiment of this because it allows an artist to be creative and, and experiment and explore uh, new subjects, new mediums, and uh, just have a, a, an opportunity to, to express themselves. Um, however, this kind of pigeonholes ourselves into a metaphysical box where anything and everything exists. So, I mean, if you want to mix oil and acrylic, go for it. If you want to mix Play-Doh and, and bronze, well, it's really a great opportunity. However, you're going to reach a point where you want to actually present something that's not going to deteriorate over time, or you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're articulating yourself to your audience. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Another phrase often used is draftsmanship, how well a painting or drawing or sculpture is executed. Well, that's not really helpful because it either is or it isn't. So if, we, uh, if there are no rules in art and or that we're using draftsmanship, well, neither of these are really helpful. So what in the Bob Ross are we supposed to do? Now, I've been painting and selling my work professionally for well over 10 years now. So I've kind of come up with a bit of a system to help myself problem solve as I'm going through a, a new series of paintings or drawings. Uh, now, the basics of this are, are going to be axioms or principles that exist in design and, and, and art. So this, none of these are going to be new necessarily. The only thing I'm offering is the structure. I own no monopoly on the, the, the basics of it. Uh, so within that structure, I'm allowing, you to, allowing us to kind of look through this and methodically pinpoint exactly where in our, uh, where in our, 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 our piece that we're having problems with. And uh, this works for many different mediums, and I hope to show you as many as I can through this video. The system I came up with, I call the, the SIT method. The SIT method is nothing more than a simple acronym to help us break down the principles. Uh, the principles I've broken into three columns, which are structure, itinerary, and technique. And within each one of those, there are three items that correspond to that. Collectively, those nine items is what I call these three by threes. Let's begin with dimension, our first item under our structure and the sit method. So what do I mean by dimension? Well, by dimension, I mean, uh, is it an eight by 10 painting? Is it gonna be 11 by 14 print? Uh, will there be prints made, uh, reproductions made? Um, will this be in a museum? Will it be in a, will it be with tall ceilings? Will it be in a public space? Will it be an exterior? Will it be a, a mural? Would it be um, an interactive piece where people interact with, they move into the space and the space interacts with them? Will it be a digital space, an NFT or the metaverse? When somebody uh, begins to interact with it, how do they interact with it within that digital space? To illustrate, I'm gonna use Jurassic Park from Universal Studios as an example of a studio troubleshooting in a dimension. For the film, a huge practical effects T-Rex puppet was made. These images come from a blog at stanwinstonschool.com. While making the skin for this huge puppet, the material would begin to shrink a little. So they would have to create patchworks to help uh, fill in the gaps. Additionally, as they were making the puppet, they were under the impression that this would not be getting wet. However, if you've seen the film, there is a lot of water. So this uh, material would actually soak up a lot of that water, making the puppet super heavy. So between takes or between uh, uh, shooting, they would have to towel off the T-Rex. So as you can see, dimension is very important. And that's why I've said it as number one. So now we've discussed dimension, let's take a look at surface. When I talk about surfaces, I mean surfaces holistically. Yes, are you going to be using canvas, aluminum, copper, or any other material and making sure it's prepped properly. But also, will you be using acrylic, oil, watercolors? And when you use these materials, are you using best practices such as uh, like with oil fat over lean and also making sure that you have uh, light fast materials for longevity. If we're confident of our dimension, then we can go in troubleshooting the surface and the materials of our work. The last item in our first column is grids, or the structure of our composition. When it comes to grids, there are many different options for available for artists. But today I'm going to just focus on the dynamic symmetry rectangle grid. If you're not familiar with this grid, it can look like a hot mess of spider webs and string and, and whatnot, but uh, I promise you it's actually quite simple once you understand the pattern. 
So let's take a look at this grid broke down a little bit further in color. Starting with any rectangle or square or parallelogram, you'll be able to see that you can just kind of break this down quickly. We begin by starting our lines at either the corners and or the center of the perimeter. Choosing our first corner, we begin making our lines with a ruler. This creates three lines. This will happen when we cross all four corners. Then starting at the perimeter, at all four perimeters, we begin making our four lines and that will happen across all four center perimeters. Creating this actually goes pretty quickly because as you begin working your way around the perimeter, it creates lines for other corners and middle perimeters. You can quickly see if it's completed simply by looking at the corners and make sure there's three lines and the center perimeters and making sure there's four lines. So why do we take the time to create this dynamic symmetry rectangle? Well, at the intersecting points, you have halves, thirds, and quarters of our canvas. So why the heck do we break up our canvas? Well, we broke up our canvas so that we can create the scaffolding for our design and composition. Let's take a look at a couple examples. These next couple of images are from theartofcomposition.com. This is a great resource if you want to do a deep dive and compositional theory. And uh, there's also resources there where you can download uh, templates that already have the grid set up for you. Let's add the grid and see if the artist made any compositional choices. I'd like to quickly point out that even though there's intersections everywhere, you don't necessarily have to put something there. For instance, there could have been a bird or something, but the artist chose not to put it here. Again, these are guidelines. Now we can see that the artist chose this area to create a lot of detail, depth, a lot of information. And in order to help balance the piece, the artist chose to keep this area light and less detail. Once we put the grid back on and we begin exploring it with an eye for composition, you can see where the artist made certain choices. Now I can hear you saying, well, I typically do figures, not landscapes. Well, no worries, let's take a look at the figure. Here's another piece from theartofcomposition.com. This is a figure sitting down on a stool or a, a ottoman. Let's take some grids and put it on top of it and see what we can find out compositionally. Once we turn on the grids, you can see compositionally where the artist chose to add uh, elements. You can see it kind of cut into thirds, quarters, and you can see how the artist chose to balance things throughout the piece. Let's remove the grids one more time. And here again, you can see the, uh, the artist chose to add uh, a lot of detail here in the area at the ottoman. And then as you go up, you can see it, they balanced it by having very little information at the top here. Now what's an artist to do if they don't really have time to go about making grids for everything? So what you could do is you could create templates like what I have done here, or you could just simply use the rule of thirds. Now the quickest way to establish a rule of thirds is to simply use your phone. Most modern phones, you'll be able to turn on the rule of thirds just simply in your native app. Additionally, you can set the perspective or the aspect ratio, and you can do five by seven, eight by 10, one by one. Uh, but in this example, it's, this sort of looks like an eight by 10. So what I'll do is I'll turn my aspect ratio to eight by 10, turn on my grids, and now I can get pretty close to my rule of thirds, and then I can just check them on my canvas on where I want those lines to be. So in summation, in the structure column, the first three by threes is going to be the dimension, it's going to be the structure, and then it's also going to be the grids. So now we're done with the first three by threes, let's look at the second three by threes in the itinerary column. You can kind of think of this as the journey. Where's the setting? Who are the characters? And what is the story that's happening? Now all three of these are very much intertwined, so we'll be talking about them collectively and as I'm going through examples. Well, let's begin with a three-legged stool analogy where each leg represents the story, the character, and the setting. They don't all have to have the same importance or the same length, but they all still need to be there. And as a reminder, these are areas for you to be able to troubleshoot. You may, or you may choose to not have any of these, such as if you want to do just do a study, and that's okay too. Let's look at the example of a Mark Rothko. This is a abstract expressionism, so let's see if this follows that three-legged stool analogy. Even though this piece isn't trying to be representational, we can still kind of interpret a setting, story, and characters. For instance, I'm seeing a yellow background, that's our setting. The characters are the red and the maroon squares, and there appears to be some conflict between them with that white line. Now this is abstract expressionism, so the artists are going to give a lot of leeway to the interpretation of it. 
Now I can already hear people saying, well, that's a bit of a stretch. So why don't we move up a little bit more into the representational world? Here's a piece by one of my favorite artists, Ivan Earl. He was the background artist for Walt Disney's 1959 Sleeping Beauty. And you can still see his uh, influence on animation today. So now we know what we're looking for, we can clearly see that we have the old tree with a new tree, and maybe there's some sort of uh, imparting wisdom going on there. Uh, in the background, uh, it's in a forest, and those trees in the background could very well be supporting characters. So what makes this interesting, besides just being a nice landscape, is that there is a story going on there that can be interpreted. Now, I'm still hearing people saying like, well, this is still kind of cartoony. I would really like to see something more really representational. Well, I got you covered. Here we have Albert Bierstead's Among the Sierra Nevadas, a quintessential Hudson River School of Design of Art uh, piece that's very representational. Here you can definitely tell the importance is placed on setting. There are characters, but they're subdued, and there is some story, and again, it was subdued, but they still exist. Let's zoom in and take a look at the characters. Here we have two groups of characters. We don't really have a main character and a supporting character, although in this case we have a main group and a subgroup. The way the artist positions the characters invites us to go and explore the setting with them. Now I can hear you say those are some great examples of some paintings, what about 3D? Alright, let's move into the 3D world. Here we have Bernini's Apollo and Daphne. Now, this is a single sculpture uh, carved from marble and is shown in three different views so you can kind of see, we kind of walk around it in, uh, in digital space. This is an amazing sculpture. I've had, been fortunate enough to see it in person and uh, the, the intricacies of it are amazing. But let's, let's get back into, uh, does it fit the three-legged stool? Well, there's clearly two characters interacting in the space and there's a, definitely a story going on between the two characters, but is there a setting? If we zoom in a little bit down at the bottom, we can see that there's uh, tree roots and sprigs and leaves as Daphne's turning into a tree. So even if we're not familiar with the story, we can tell that this is taking place outside, probably in a forest. Now I'm hearing some people say that's fine and dandy for traditional artists. Well, what about digital? All right, let's take a look at some digital art. Here we have a still from Walt Disney's Frozen 2. We can definitely tell that there's characters, they're in the forefront, they're looking out to the distance and it looks like there's going to be some sort of journey, and you can definitely tell the setting. So the next three items in our second column is uh, the itinerary. Now the itinerary is our journey or our the who, what, when, where, and why of our, of our piece. Uh, so remember the three-legged stool where you have uh, a setting, you have a character or characters, and you have a story. Once we feel like we have confidence that we've troubleshot in our first and second columns, now it's time to move on to our third column, Technique. And in that, our very first item is Value. When we talk about value, we just simply mean the whitest whites and the darkest darks, and all the steps in between. So let's take a look at this study. Let's focus in on this area right here under the chin. See how in the shadow area, this value is nice and dark whereas the neck out of the shadow is mid value and the brightest spot on the shoulder is very high in value. This illusion gives us the interpretation of the volume of the figure. There's actually very little areas of extreme highs or extreme lows. This drawing is mostly made up of variants of mid values. So to troubleshoot our paintings or drawings, are we using enough mid values to articulate our volumes or our distances? Or are we using extreme values with purpose or are we choosing to leave them out again with purpose. Once we're happy with our values, the next item to troubleshoot is the line or the edge of our work. We can draw one of two ways. We can draw with value or we can draw with line. Let's see some examples. Here we have Albert Durer's self-portrait age 13. You'll notice he's using lines to create most of his values. If we zoom in, we can really appreciate the cross-hatching technique. It's a commonly used technique in today's comic book and graphic novels. Notice how the lines in the shirt really create the illusion of fold, volume, and depth. Now, let's look at the face of the figure. See how again, cross-hatching is used to create the values and the volumes. Let's quickly jump back to the previous study and compare the edges. See how in this study, line is created by the artist choosing how extreme the values are adjacent to other values. For instance, here at the neck, there is no dedicated line or stroke to indicate the change to shadow. Simply by having the relatively extreme values next to each other, we see the illusion of a line. 
we can see this technique used many times in the fabric adorning the figure's head. So by evaluating our edges, we can troubleshoot areas of our work that don't seem to give the illusion we're attempting to create. Once we're happy with our values and our lines or edges, the very last thing that we take a look at is color. Now there's a humorous saying in art that value does all the work and color gets all the credit. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that uh, when you show your work and people come up to you and say, oh, I love your colors. Um, that may be true, but they don't understand like the underpinning of those colors is the value, the lights and darks. The color is sort of the window dressing. For instance, if somebody is colorblind, well, the color has no value to them. And other people have color blindness to certain families of colors. So the color is very important, but just make sure you get your values squared away. Okay, okay, we know value now is very important. So let's get back to color. How do we troubleshoot color? Okay, well, let's look at our color wheel. We have no shortage of color options to choose from. Go to any art supply store and you'll be greeted with a bounty of color choices. For digital artists, there's billions of colors to choose from on your screen. So how can we problem solve our colors without <coughs> sneezing colors everywhere? Well, let's simplify our choices. We can begin paring down our color choices by using a simple guideline or rule called the 60-30-10 rule. If we use an example of a painting, we could use 60% of a color for the primary color, 30% of another color for the secondary color, and 10% for an accent color. They'll certainly have other colors within the painting, but they'll be far more subdued than this 60-30-10 rule. Let's look at some examples. Oftentimes this rule or theory or guideline is used in uh, everywhere from uh, staging and interior design and in fashion such as formal wear like men's ties, shirts, and sports jackets. It's not unusual to have movies use this rule. Uh, a lot of times it's used to create a sense of mood or atmosphere or a sense of foreboding or uh, an interior space that really wants to like focus on a particular item or person or somewhere that you want to draw the eye. One could argue that, well, these are all recent examples. What about uh, paintings and drawings? Well, let's take a trip through art history to see if this rule applies. Here we have Raphael's The School of Athens, 1510, well over 500 years ago. Now this exists within the context of an area inside the Vatican. But let's zoom in and focus on the painting. So let's evaluate if there's any 60, 30, 10 rules going on here. We can certainly tell that there is a primary color, the tan, there is a secondary color, which is the orange, and an accent color, which is the blue. Pretty cool, huh? But arguably this is really far back in the Renaissance, so how about we come back a little bit further in our timeline. Here we have Jean-Léon Jérôme's Police Verso 1872, supposedly the painting that inspired the movie Gladiator. Let's see if this painting follows any rhythm of color. Well, we can definitely tell that there's this beige peachy color, followed by the uh, secondary, which would be this olive green, and then lastly, the accent color of red. I'm sure it's no coincidence that those colors were used in this painting. We won't really get into color theory for this because we're trying to troubleshoot our colors. So what about more contemporary paintings where artists have access to the thousands of colors at their disposal? Let's jump to the 21st century. Here we have a painting by Kahindi Wiley, uh, 2005, relatively recent, uh, at least at the publishing of this video. Let's evaluate the volume of colors used by the artist. When we first look at the painting, we are immediately enthralled by the red, so we think that's maybe the majority of this painting. However, if we look at the yellow, there's actually the majority of the painting is yellow, followed by the red, which is the secondary, and then green, the accent color. So lastly, in our last column, we have technique. And in technique, we have the last three of the three by threes, which is the value, the line or the edge, and color. So the next time you're getting frustrated or feeling like you hit a roadblock with your work, remember to take a deep breath and sit. And once you're in a good headspace, then run through Lee's three by threes, beginning with number one, dimension. How will our work exist in the world? What physical or digital space will our audience be interacting with, with our art? Surface. How will we be prepping the surface of the work? Are we using appropriate materials and are we using best practices with those materials? Grids. Are we happy with the scaffolding and composition of our artwork? Four, five, and six, the three-legged stool. Does our artwork have setting, a character, and a story? 
Seven, value. Are we confident in our values to articulate the volumes and depth of our shapes? Eight, line and edge. Have we established an appropriate lines and edges to communicate our shapes? And finally, number nine, color. Are we using color to our advantage to inform our audiences of the intended mood and atmosphere of our piece? So hopefully you found this video useful. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below or shoot me an email, find me on my social medias. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'd appreciate your follow. Uh, I'll see you in the next video.